Thanks very much, Frontier Junction. And it's a pleasure to be speaking here. So my topic is short exponential sums of the primes. And this is based on um, several joint works with Kaisa Matamaki, Maxim Rajavi, uh, Fernando Shaw, Terry Tao, and Tamar Ziegler. So um, I'll start by explaining to you what sort of exponential sums we'll be looking at and what's been previously known about them. And then I'll state the new main theorems we can say about these short exponential sums. And then I'll discuss some applications of those exponential sum results. And finally, I'll say a few words about the proofs of some of these results. Okay, so the main question in this talk is the following. Given some interesting arithmetic function f, what can we say about short exponential sums of that function? So by a short exponential sum, I mean just the usual sum of f twisted by an additive character taken over a short interval of the length x to the theta, or more generally, you take a polynomial phase twist. So you twist by e of p of n, where p is any polynomial of a fixed degree. So we'll mostly be looking at this more general case of polynomial phase twists. And the key parameter here is the interval length, so x to the theta. So how small can you make theta? Of course, it depends on your function, um, but that's the parameter that we try to minimize. And the kind of bounds that we want for these sums depend on whether your um, polynomial is sort of um, major arc in a certain sense, in which you get an asymptotic, or if it's a minor arc, in which case you expect cancellation for the sum. And so for the time we being, we'll consi um, consider all intervals, but one could also consider this exponential sum for almost all choices of the interval. Uh, so that we'll do a bit later in this talk. And so, We'll mostly concentrate on three arithmetic functions in this talk. So three very natural functions. One of them is the Möbius function. So it's just the parity of the number of prime factors of the integer n, if n is square free and zero otherwise. So for the Möbius function, we would always expect cancellation in this kind of exponential sums, no matter what the polynomial is. Secondly, we'll consider the primes, or rather the fundamental function, which is a weighted indicator of the primes. So you give weight log p when n is a power of p and zero otherwise. And for exponential sums of the fundamental function, you expect cancellation when your polynomial is minor arc, and you expect a certain main term when your polynomial has rational coefficients with small denominator. And finally, we'll consider the higher order divisor functions. So dk n is the number of ways to write n as a product of k natural numbers. And so these are the three classes of functions that we look at in this talk. One could certainly consider there are plenty of other interesting multiple functions as well. And some of our results possibly could be adapted to those functions. Um, things like um, sums of two squares, the indicator of that, or various other functions, but I'll just be concentrating on these functions um, for the rest of this talk. And so if we want to understand the short exponential sums of any of these functions, so the Möbius function, von Mangold, or the divisor function, we should first review what's known about the long sums, so the dyadic sums. Uh, so here p of x is any polynomial fixed degree. And it turns out that these long exponential sums with an exponential phase twist are well understood by cl classical works of Vinogradov, Davenport, and Hua, basically from the 1930s. So they studied the varying Goldbach problem, and this kind of exponential sums arose there. So in particular, for any of these functions, one can get good arbitrary power of log cancellation in the long exponential sum, unless your polynomial is major arc in a certain sense. 
And what do I mean by major arc? I mean that all the coefficients of your polynomial are very close to rationals of small denominator. And to make it more precise, there's some number Q, which is not too large, so bounded by a power of log, such that if alpha j are the coefficients of your polynomial, then Q times alpha j, the distance to the nearest integer of that number is extremely close to zero in this precise sense. Okay, so that's the major R case. And in the co uh, complementary case, you get cancellation. Okay, and what if we are in the major R case? Well, then we also understand what happens for these long exponential sums, basically because then P of N, so all the coefficients are very close to rationals of denominator Q. So basically P of N is just a Q periodic function with Q being bounded by a power of log. And therefore, if you're twisting F by a Q periodic function, you just need to understand the mean value of F in Einstein regressions modulo Q and that you can do by the Siegel Wolfis theorem or variance of that theorem for the Möbius function and the divisor functions. And therefore, also in the Mazarak case, we can understand these sums and get some main term for them, although that main term may look a little complicated. So it's a term that comes out of the circle method. Um, so there is a sort of simplification that we'll use in this talk, which avoids the need to split into major and minor arcs and to define what precisely are the parameters that define these arcs. And um, also then we don't need to worry about the main terms, what kind of objects we get out of those if we do the following. So we compare our model, uh, our uh, arithmetic function f to a simpler model function. So uh, f model will be some function which behaves very much like f. So the exponential sum of f is very close to the exponential sum of the f model pointwise. And crucially, this model function will be a lot simpler to work with. So we want to find a model function such that on the Fourier side, it's very close to the original function, but it's easier to work with. And if we do this, then we don't need to worry about the major and minor arc uh, sort of splitting and whether you're in one of those cases or not, if you just compare F to this model. Okay, and of course the question arises, what models should you pick for the Möbius function, the fundamental function and the divisor functions? So what kind of models should we take so that we can easily compare or hope to compare the exponential sums of the original functions of those models. And for the Möbius function, it's very simple. We just take the model function to be zero because we don't expect any main term in exponential sums of the Möbius function. So there's no need to compare it to anything simpler. You just, by the uh, Möbius randomness heuristic, you expect that you have cancellation everywhere for every single polynomial. So um, there's no need to subtract any model function from the Möbius function. For the formal function, we do need to subtract the model function to avoid the major minor arc decomposition. And the model that we chose is what's called the w trick model. So basically, um, you approximate the integrator of the primes by only taking into account the small prime factors. So the fact that primes never have small prime factors less than some parameter w, and you don't worry about the large prime factors. And then you just take the indicator of numbers which have no small, small prime factors, and you renormalize that so that the mean value is one. And the truncation parameter that we take for the um, small prime factors is either the log x to the one over 10, but it's not too important what this parameter is. So there's quite a lot of wiggle room. One could change this parameter quite a bit. It's just to balance some error terms that we choose this particular value. Um, so for this model function, one can show that, uh, for example, the partial sums behave very much similarly as for the formangle function. 
basically by the fundamental lemma of the sieve. And for dk, um, it's slightly trickier to find a good model function, but one can take this kind of truncated divisor sum. So you take the divisor sum over only small divisors going up to a very small power of x. So x into eta k, where eta is a very small number. And you have these certain polynomials evaluated at log n, where these polynomials are explicit polynomials of degree k minus one. So I won't give the definition of these polynomials, they're fully explicit, but it takes some space. So um, it's not an entirely trivial model function, but the key point here is that um, the divisor sum is short. So the n variable only goes up to a tiny power of x. And therefore this is a nice type one sum that's a lot easier to understand than the original dk function. And similarly for the um, model of the von Mangel function. So for this function, we can, for example, evaluate its correlations using the fundamental lemma uh, without any problem because this W parameter is not too large. And similarly for the DK function, we can evaluate its correlations because the, um, again, the divisor sum is truncated from a small power of X. So, um, it's a bit like um, often in additive combinatorics, especially in connection with the transference principle. If one is, uh, let's say, so one has an application to um, counting linear patterns weighted by a function f, then it's often simpler to first model that function f by a simpler function, and then for the simpler function, evaluate the count of these patterns weighted by the function. One could also formulate all our results with the usual major and minor arc decomposition. Uh, it would just look slightly trickier. Okay, and actually there are several uh, possible models for each of these functions. So it's not a, a unique model. One could use different ones and get largely similar results. So for example, for the von Wengel function, one could also take a truncated version of the convolution identity uh, that lambda is mu convolved with the logarithmic function. So if one truncates that identity, one gets an approximation for the von function, which is um, you just truncate this divisor sum from, from, from some parameter. And you could take, for example, this value for the parameter. Um, or for dk, um, Actually, there are simpler model functions if one only aims for um, a small amount of cancellation in the exponential sum. So the model that we chose gives power savings, but if one only wanted a small power of log saving, one could use this simpler model with, um, so you take the identity that dk is one convolved with dk minus one, and you truncate that from a certain parameter. So the, you take the divisors only up to n to the alpha, and you normalize by alpha to minus k. So that's the model introduced by Andrade and Smith. Um, but the reason we chose these particular models is so, um, well, for the from angle function, um, okay, firstly, it's easy to compute the correlations of the um, w tricked function. And secondly, it's a non negative function which is helpful for some applications to additive combinatorics, which I'll mention later. Um, basically because of um, in the theory of Gauss norms, you need pseudo random majorants. And if you have a non-negative function, it's a lot easier to work with those um, pseudo random majorants. Um, and for the DK function, we chose our model because with that model, you can get power saving error terms. But again, if you don't care about the quality of the error terms, you could use something simpler. So it's not, there's again, flexibility in which model you choose. Okay. Um, now, let me discuss what's known about these short exponential sums previously. Um, so starting with the von Mangold case. So if you have the von Mangold twisted by a polynomial phase, um, there's work of Zan, 
who proved that four intervals of length x to the 5 over 8 plus epsilon and degree one polynomials, so E of alpha n, he proved cancellation the sum for the minor R case and a main term for the major R case. And a few years ago, Matamaki and Shao handled the case of higher degree polynomials, and they got an interval length of x to the two terms plus epsilon. So two terms is slightly bigger than five over eight. And for the Möbius case, one can, one can actually do a bit better. So uh, Matamaki and myself proved that for Möbius, you can take intervals of length x to the three fifths plus epsilon, again, for the degree one case. Although the price you have to pay here is that the amount of cancellation is a small power of log as opposed to an arbitrary power of log. And Finally, for the divisor functions, if one just adapts the method of Matamaki and Shao, one could prove cancellation in this exponential sum for um, interval length. So in the case of D2, intervals of length x to the one half plus epsilon. And in the case of D3 and higher for intervals of length x to the two terms plus epsilon. So the same interval length as for the von Mangle function. Okay, and um, so as I already mentioned, one can also consider what happens in almost all intervals. So what if you only consider this exponential sum for almost all values of x up to capital X, meaning that you can throw away little o x bad intervals where you don't know what happens. Okay, so then you can ask a similar question. Um, but now we take the supremum. So for every short interval, take the worst possible polynomial that makes this um, exponential sum the largest. And can we show that for almost all intervals, the correlation is still, still small for, all, uh, for the worst possible polynomial? So it's a supremum problem in short intervals, uh, which is considerably harder than if you fixed your polynomial. Let's say you had um, square root of two and squared for every interval. So here you're allowed to vary the polynomial depending on the interval. Um, so there are not too many results about this, but there is uh, a result of Matamaki, Rajavir, and Tal. So they proved that if you have the Möbius function, then you can take intervals of length x to the epsilon. And you almost always get, get cancellation in this short exponential sum, which is supremum. And well, for the form angle function, of course, you could consider the sort of simplest possible case where the degree of your polynomial is zero. In other words, you don't have a polynomial factor. Then you're looking at prime to short intervals. And for that, the best result is due to Huxley. So it's intervals of length x to the one sixth plus epsilon. So that's certainly a limit of what one can hope for for the primes, because that's what we can do in the degree zero case. And Matamaki Rasvi and Tau uh, also considered the dk case uh, if the degree is zero. So if you just have a short sum of dk, and then again, one can take x to the epsilon length intervals and get an asymptotic for that. Okay, so that's basically what's known about the um, almost all problem. And now we come to um, our main results. So we have results about all intervals and about almost all intervals. So let's start with the all interval case. So this is uh, with Matamaki, Shao, Tao, and myself. So um, the setup is the following. Um, so take your function f, which is either mu or lambda or dk, and subtract the model so that we don't need to worry about major and minor arc. Um, and look at this exponential sum. So you take the supremum over all polynomials of a fixed degree d, 
and you're looking for a cancellation in the sum, so the trivial bound will be h. And let's recall the model function. So the model of maybe is zero, and the model of the formula function is this W trick model. And so in any of the following cases, we get cancellation in the sum. So the first one is if f is either the Mebius or the fundamental function, then we can take intervals of length x to the three, uh, five over eight plus epsilon. And the amount of saving we get is an arbitrary power of log. Secondly, if f is either the Mebius function or dk with k at least four, we can take intervals of length x to the three fifths plus epsilon. But then we only get a small power of log saving as opposed to a large power of log. So the exponent is smaller, but the saving is also uh, smaller. And finally, if f is the dk divisor function, so for d2, we can take intervals of length x to the one third plus epsilon. For d3, we can take intervals of length x to the five over nine plus epsilon. And for higher dk, we can take intervals of length x to the five over eight plus epsilon and with power saving error terms. So here, perhaps the most interesting case is the D2 case, where we get down to x to the one third length intervals. And note that there's some, um, so, some of these, uh, to some functions, you can apply several of these results. So for example, to the Mavis function, you can apply either one or two, but they don't imply each other because there's kind of a trade-off here. So if you want, arbitrary power of log savings, then you need to take five over eight as your exponent. If you allow just saving a small power of log, you can do a better exponent. And similarly with dk here, um, if you want power savings for k at least four, the best we can do is five over eight. But if you just want a power of log savings, you can do three over five. Okay. And Again, the point of the model function is just that you don't need to, um, you can take the supreme over all polynomials. Are there any questions about this theorem or anything so far? What does CK look like as K grows? Um, so it's, it's quite a small power, maybe something comparable to one over K, um, like some constant divided by K, I think if I'm not mistaken. So uh, the only question in the chat uh, Ed, from Jakob Steipel, is there some simple intuition for why we get these uniform results for DK? Um, okay, so I assume you mean the model that you can uh, separate a suitable model from the DK function, and then you don't need to worry about uh, what your polynomial looks like. Uh, so, Basically, you would expect to be able to do that for almost any reasonable function. Um, uh, let's say you start with the convolution identity for dk. So if you're, for example, thinking of the simpler model of uh, Andrade and Smith that I mentioned, which was this, um, uh, this function here. So it just comes from the fact that dk is the convolution of one and dk minus one. Uh, but then you truncate that. So you sort of expect that the um, on the Fourier side, uh, the um, so the Fourier characters only see the um, small divisors. So the divisor is going up to a certain small power. And then the other divisor should, you should just expect cancellation for the rest of the sum. And therefore, this sum should be a good model for the, um, for the DK. It's so suitably normalized so that also on the major arcs, it agrees with DK. And uh, Andrew Granville, if you'd like to unmute. Well, it's related to the question you just answered, but um, in your model for DK, you you looked at divisors less than n to the epsilon. Yeah. So you take no account of the large prime factors at all. And yeah. so you expect the divisor function to be out by a constant factor. So it's surprising yeah. that you claim it's a good model. Uh, yeah, in fact, it's not such a good model that you would get very strong 
uh, error terms. And that's exactly the reason that we had this more complicated one, uh, which was kind of um, a sum of log n for suitable polynomials, which comes basically from a residue calculation. So the uh, indeed, this simpler model only agrees up to a small power of log with a divisor function. And if you want a model that agrees up to power saving error terms, then um, you can get something like this, just um, sort of, again, starting with the convolution identity and then approximating uh, sums by integrals and then computing those integrals. Uh, something like this pops up. Okay, thank you. So, yeah. Okay. Um, so a few remarks are in order. So first, the first part of the theorem generalizes Zan's work because Zan got the same exponent for degree one polynomials. And also it improves on the exponent of Matamaki and Shao who had two thirds for arbitrary polynomials. And the second result generalizes the work of uh, Kaisa and myself where we handled the degree one case from Mebius and got intervals of length three fifths. And finally, the uh, D2 case, so the third part, um, if you just take degree zero polynomials, in other words, you don't take a polynomial twist here, um, then it basically recovers the Voronoi uh, result that um, you can handle uh, short sums of D2 of length x to the one third plus epsilon. So it's kind of a natural exponent that comes out of the, the x to the one third because it's the one that comes up in Voronoi as well. Okay, so um, that's the result about all intervals. What about almost all intervals? So this is still work in progress with Matomaki, Rajaviv, uh, Shao, and Tao. So if we now look at this exponential sum, again, the same thing for almost all values of x. So we allow uh, an exceptional set of size x times um, an arbitrary negative power of log, then again, we get cancellation in any of the following cases. So in the case of the von Mangel function, we can now do intervals of length x to the one third plus epsilon for almost all short sums with an arbitrary power of log saving. And for either the Mebius function or the divisor functions, we can do uh, intervals of length x to the epsilon. But now delta is fixed. In other words, we get such the qualitative saving and not a quantitative one. Um, okay, so again, let me say a few remarks. So as far as I know, the uh, result for the von Mangold is new even for the degree one case. Um, the fact that we have the supremum here makes the problem quite a bit harder that you are taking the um, Worst possible polynomial for every interval. And secondly, uh, so the DK result is also new. And the um, result for the Mebius function, well, that uh, we proved in an earlier paper with Matomaki Razaviv, uh, Tao, and Ziegler, but with a quantitative, uh, sorry, only a qualitative saving on the exceptional set. So there we were saying that there's little x exceptional values of the interval. And here we get a quantitative saving of power of log on the set of intervals. Okay, so um, let me also mention this result here. So the uh, results from 2020, um, because it's not superseded by this one either for another reason. So, um, so there we just consider the Mebius function, or in fact, bounded multiplicative functions in that paper. And um, we got qualitative cancellation in the short exponential sum with the supremum for almost all values. But we could take the h parameter quite small. So e to the log x to the 5 over 8 plus epsilon. Whereas on the previous slide, it was x to the epsilon. And 
So about this theorem, it um, generalizes what Matamaki, Rasavi, and Tao did for the degree one case. And they had AC equals X to epsilon. And what's interesting here is that if one could do considerably shorter intervals yet, so if one could take H to be as small as log X to the little one, then Chalos conjecture would follow. So Chalos conjecture, um, let me recall, is the statement that um, the Möbius function does not correlate with its own shifts. So if you take any shifts H1 up to HK, and you take the Möbius function multiplied with these shifts, you should get cancellation. So that's Chalos conjecture. Um, and if somehow one could do much, much better um, in the H aspect, one could prove Chawla, but um, we don't know how to do that. Um, and let me also mention that um, we can deal with a larger class of phase functions than just the uh, exponential polynomial phases. So in fact, we can deal with a class of functions which are the nil sequences of degree d. Um, and we get the same, same results for them. So the uh, first result I mentioned about the all intervals and the second result I mentioned about almost all intervals. Instead of a supreme over polynomials, you can take a supreme over a larger class of nil sequences. OK, so what are nil sequences? Well, we don't need the precise definition in this talk. Um, just examples are more than enough. We won't be using the term um, later, but so any exponential polynomial phase is a nil sequence, firstly. And secondly, you can also have things like bracket polynomials. So um, you combine uh, polynomial operations with the floor function in any way, and you get objects such as this. So these would also be basically nil sequences. And finally, let me just briefly mention the general definition, although we won't need it. So um, you take some nil manifold, G mod gamma, so a Lie group, uh, so G is a Lie group, and gamma is a lattice inside that. And then you take some polynomial map from the integers to the Lie group, and finally, you take a Lipschitz function from the nil manifold, um, and you compose them as f of gn modulo gamma, and that's your nil sequence. So just to give the simplest possible example, if your Lie group is the real numbers, and the lattice is uh, the integers, then you have r mod z, which is the torus, so that will be a nil manifold, and on the torus, uh, you would just have a polynomial modulo one, an ellipsis function of that. So if you fully expand the ellipsis function, you get basically this kind of polynomial exponential phases. So um, um, nil sequences on that, nil manifolds just boil down to the polynomial case. Um, but so the reason I'm mentioning the nil sequence case as well is that um, it's what we need for some applications to uh, additive combinatorics. And the connection to nil sequences comes via Gower's norms. Um, so let me um, briefly mention what Gower's norms are. Again, we don't need the concept after these slides, after this slide. Um, but so if you have a function on the indices with finite support, you can define this kind of counting object. So it's counting um, k-dimensional parallelepipeds weighted by your function f. And then you can also define this object for a function defined on a short interval. So that's the case that we're interested in, in the short interval Gauss norms, which means you just restrict your function to the interval and take the UKZ Gauss norm and you normalize by the length, uh, by the um, UKZ norm of the indicator of this interval. Okay, so these are uh, objects that naturally arise when you try to count any kind of patterns. Um, 
in, in your set. So for example, if f was the indicator to primes and you would be counting linear equations into primes, you would naturally bounce into these Gauss norms. So it's just the concept that comes up. And the key point is that um, there's something called the inverse theorem for the Gauss norms, which says that proving bounds for these Gauss norms is equivalent to bounding um, exponential sums of f twisted by nil sequences. So that's where the nil sequence results come into play. And they immediately imply the following. So um, if we, again, take f to be either the Möbius function or the von Mangel function, and we look at the short UK Gauss norm of f minus the model, we get some cancellation here. So the trivial bound will be bigger of one. We get little of one. Um, in any of the following cases. And these cases directly correspond to um, the two previous theorems that we had. So the all intervals case and the almost all intervals case. So for example, um, for Möbius, we can take intervals of length uh, three fifths. For von Mangold, we can take intervals of length five over eight. So these are exactly the same exponents as before and exactly for the same reasons. So it's really just an application of those results uh, with the nil sequence twist. And we can take also the Möbius function and intervals of length x to the epsilon for almost all x. Or the von Mangel function, intervals of length x to the one third plus epsilon and almost all x. So these correspond to the almost all result that we had. Um, so I'm mentioning this Gauss norm result because it's the one that we apply for most of our applications. Um, so let me now mention a few applications that we have of these results. So um, firstly, we can do um, a short interval version of the linear equations in primes theorem of Greentown Ziegler. So this is using our all intervals result, and in particular, um, part two of this uh, corollary about Gauss norms. So using this fact uh, that the Gauss norm of von Mangold is small on intervals length x to the five over eight, we can say the following. If you take any set of k linear forms in several variables, and if these linear forms are pairwise independent, then we can count how often all of them are simultaneously prime. And with crucially this um, vector n restricted to a short interval. So all the variables are restricted to short intervals of length x to the five over eight. And the asymptotic, I don't write it here, but it's a sort of local to global principle. It's kind of what you would expect to get. And okay, so you can do things like, let's say you have the ternary Goldbach equation and you want all of your primes to be very close to each other. So, uh, within n to the five over eight plus epsilon from each other. And you also can add some extra conditions like let's say 2p1 minus p2 is also a prime. So we can find solutions to this kind of equations and you could add more equations if you wanted. Um, if you just had the Goldbach equation, uh, there are already results of this shape with a better exponent, but we can take any number of these equations as long as you have something which um, doesn't look like trim primes or uh, the binary Goldbach problem. So this result directly generalizes the um, linear equations in prime theorem of Greenthal Ziegler, as I said. So they did the same result for um, variables coming from long intervals. And also another application of the um, Gauss norm result, which I'll just briefly mention, is to ergodic theory. So um, there's a result of Franz Kanakis, Hostan Kra, and Wolle and Ziegler about um, multiple ergodic averages of the primes. So we can now do a short interval version of that result, basically just using the fact that uh, the result is based on the uh, Gauss uniformity of the fermanual function, which we can now do in short intervals. So we get a short interval result of their result as well. 
Okay, so um, we also have applications to um, correlations on average. In particular, in particular, so I already mentioned Charles connector, the uh, claim that the shifts of Mobius are independent of each other, so they don't correlate. So this is currently known only for k equals two and k odd. But using uh, our result from 2020, so uh, with Matamaki, Rajavi, uh, Tao, and Ziegler, we proved that um, for almost all age up to XD epsilon, you have cancellation in this correlation of Mobius for any fixed k. So k could be anything here. Um, and of course, you try to minimize the length of the interval here. So if you could take H to be bounded, that would be precisely Charles conjecture. Uh, and we could do interval length X to epsilon. So the length of H is what you want to minimize here, how little you need to average. And also using our results about um, for mangled or divisor functions in almost all sorts of intervals, and translating those again to the language of Gauss norms, uh, we can prove some results about the hard Littlewood conjecture or the divisor con uh, correlation conjecture on average over shifts. So um, for the for Mangold case, so um, hard Littlewood conjecture, we can say that for almost all h up to x to the one third plus epsilon. If you look at this one dimensional correlation of the von function, you get the expected asymptotic. So I don't write what this expected asymptotic is, but it's some kind of Euler product, which is explicitly computable. And you get that as your main term. And it's for almost all h up to this threshold. Um, so the, for the k equals two case, there's an earlier result of who got uh, an exponent of eight over 33, which is about one fourth. But as far as I know, for large divisors of K, um, the uh, previous result was the um, green tau result who handled the case of long sums. So A is going up to X. And for the divisor correlations, we can go up to, so we need to average H up to X to the epsilon only. And so you take some divisor function DL and you take the correlation of that uh, averaging over a single parameter H and we get some main term, which is the main term that you would expect. And that's for almost all H again. So, um, Again, for k equals two, something like this was known, but not for the higher values of k. Okay, so those are the um, main applications that we have. Then in the remaining time, I'll tell you just a bit about the proofs. So obviously there are several theorems here and I'll just concentrate on the case of the all interval theorem for the Fermangle function. So it was the statement that for intervals length x to the five over eight plus epsilon, the exponential sum of the Fermangle function minus the model twisted by any polynomial phase has cancellation. So let's concentrate on that proof. And the first step, as is natural, is heat Brown's identity. So his brown identity allows you to split from angle function into type one and type two sums. So you get a linear combination of sums, which essentially looks something like this. So you have E of P of N1 times so on times NK, where the product of N1 times NK is between X and X plus H, and the NI are in some dialectic intervals. So let's say that N of I is about X to the alpha I where alpha i are some exponents that sum up to one. So we need to analyze this kind of sums and the analysis of course depends on the values of alpha i. So depending on in which ranges we have the alpha i, we're going to have to use either a type one estimate or a type two estimate or um, 
a kind of I2 estimate, which is for the divisor function. So firstly, if we are in the case where k equals two, then we note that our sum is the sum over the lattice points under a hyperbola. So we have the hyperbola m times n equals something, and we are counting the lattice points under that curve. And so the way we approach this is by decomposing the set of lattice points under the hyperbola into a union of two-dimensional arithmetic progressions. So basically, you approximate the slope of the hyperbola, um, just like in the hard relatable circle method, you approximate real numbers by rationals of small denominator. So we want to get um, not too many arithmetic progressions and with not too large moduli. And so when we do this decomposition, we can split all the points under the hyperbola into a bunch of arithmetic progressions, two-dimensional, and then we're left with sums of the form E of P n1 and 2, where n1 and n2 lie in this two-dimensional AP. And this kind of sums we can understand basically because um, this just corresponds to E of another polynomial. If, for example, we had, let's say, uh, well, I mean, these are some linear forms in M1 and N2. So you get some quadratic thing here inside. And therefore, it's another polynomial that you're looking at. And that kind of sums we can certainly understand. And so the key thing here is that this decomposition that we have only works for A is bigger than X to the one third plus epsilon. So that's where the limitation for D2 comes from, that if, uh, if the interval goes smaller than x to the one third, then the decomposition no longer works. And so you could also have the case where one of your variables is very long, bigger than one minus theta, so theta is five over eight, then we could prove a type one estimate. So um, this is sort of the simpler estimate, so I won't concentrate on that. Let's instead consider in which ranges we can prove a type two estimate. So um, it turns out that if our alpha i, so these were the sizes of our divisors, if you can find the subsum of those um, alpha i, that's between one minus theta and theta, where theta is five over eight, then we can prove a type two estimate uh, in the minor arc case. So by minor arc case, or rather by major arc case, I mean the case where um, our polynomial E of P of N looks like an Archimedean character n to the IT. So note that this could actually happen. If for example, P of N is the truncation of the Taylor series of T times log N, then you would indeed get that E of P of N is approximately n to the IT. So this is what I call the major arc case. And if you are not in the major arc case, then by following the earlier approach of Matemaki and Shaw, where they got the exponent two thirds, um, we can get this kind of information. So this kind of type two information. And so for the nil sequence case, there's some extra complications in the type two estimate. We need uh, a large C for the nil sequ sequences as well as a multi-parameter factorization theorem, but I won't say anything more about those. But then we're left with the um, type two major arc case. So what if our E of P of N does look like N to the IT? Well, then we basically have a multiplicative problem that we are facing. So um, then E of P of N1 up to NK just becomes N1 to the IT times NK to the IT. And here we can apply Dirichlet polynomial methods so things like the baker herman pins uh, estimates for them. And it turns out that if there's this kind of decomposition of the index set, so the alpha i can be decomposed into three sets, such that the sum of one of them is in this range, and the other two sums are close enough, then it turns out that we can prove a type two major arc estimate. So the case where E of P of N does look like an Archimedean character. And finally, 
the key point is that if theta is five over eight plus epsilon, we can combine all these things. So um, you can do a bit of combinatorics to check that no matter what your alpha i are, you're always in one of these cases. So either um, you're in the type one case or the D2 case or the type two case, um, always one of them holds. But as soon as you reach five over eight, you have a case you can't handle, which is if you have exactly four variables, all of size one over four, and if you're in the type two major arc case. So, um, so this case here, the final case, then if theta is five over eight, this interval two theta minus one, four theta minus one, two becomes uh, one fourth, one, one over half. And you can never find a subsum of these four numbers that's between uh, one quarter and one half. So um, that's the bottle, bottleneck in our proof, the case of D4. And that's the reason that we got this five over eight exponent. And the proof of the other all interval results is kind of similar. So for the Mebius function, we also have heat Brown's identity. And for DK, we already have uh, the kind of necessary decomposition into these type one and type two sums. And then you just need to check which ranges are applicable of these type one and type two estimates. But so that's basically how we prove the result for the for Mangle function in intervals of length x to five over eight plus epsilon. And I think that's all that I want to say. Thanks a lot for listening.